So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the launch of Unlearn, Barry O'Reilly's uh, latest best-selling book, apparently. Barry, is that right? Um, so uh, I'm David Davidge. I'm the Chief of Staff uh, of the Development Division at G Research. Um, and when, so when Barry told me, uh, gave me the title of his book, uh, my immediate thought was, yes, okay, I get that. Um, and the reason for that is because in the last few years, personally, I moved into uh, a role with the ambiguous nature of chief of staffing um, into a domain which is uh, fairly new for me. So um, I had to do quite a bit of unlearning myself in the last few years. So it's been a very immediate and uh, daily process for me. Um, alongside that, uh, our organization has grown very rapidly in the last couple of years. So we've doubled in size. Um, and in our domain, so data science, the tooling has just exploded. There's been huge amounts of innovation. Um, so that's you know, the mathematical techniques and analysis tools that are now available to anybody with a half-decent machine at home um, are just astounding. So it's been really important for us as an organization to understand what that means. Um, and so unlearning has really become a core competence in some sense. Concretely, for example, we are now much more open to working with people in the outside world. We embrace open source technologies, and we're doing a lot of uh, evaluation of third party tooling and that kind of thing. So it's really been about us unlearning our bias for building everything ourselves. And actually, in fact, tonight's event is another example where we're reaching out and we want to learn more so that we can learn new ways to make our organization accelerate. So, Unlearning, it could be the competitive advantage of the 21st century. Barry, that will be up to you. Um, but it's not only, I guess, about unlearning, but also rapidly learning new things and also being able to deploy those new learnings into the marketplace. So uh, those are the reasons why we are really keen to uh, sponsor Barry's book launch this evening. And uh, I'm really looking forward to what you've got to say, Barry. Uh, particularly, uh, Barry's been uh, is a new father in the last five months, so I'm sure he's unlearned <laughs> uh, most of his uh, previous life. So, Barry, over to you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, I want to start 800 BC, uh, where the seed of a civilization, uh, a startup, if you will which would go on to become one of the greatest civilizations that we've actually known, started on seven hills in Central Europe. So at its peak of its powers, uh, the Roman Empire accounted for nearly two million square miles and, uh, and almost 20% uh, of the world's population. Now there's, there's lots of sort of hypotheses and beliefs about what allowed this civilization to start so small and scale to such massive proportions and sustain those proportions for over 2,000 years. So my question is, does anyone know? What do you think allowed them to do this? Decentralizing. Right, decentralizing is good, right? There's blockchain people here already, that's good. <laughs> what else? Reinventing themselves, good. Yeah, what else? Excellent, okay, really good. Normally someone says roads, so I'm kind of disappointed no one said roads. <laughs> or they say aqueducts, or the engineers always want to say aqueducts. Yeah, the amazing thing about the Roman culture is, as soon as they conquered civilizations and they found practices that were better than their own, they let go of their existing practices and absorbed those new practices into their systems of work. So they were constantly innovating their systems of civilization, of operation and growth, learning and unlearning based on who they met and how they incorporated them into their society to create and sustain this massive uh, sort of civilization and growth for a long, long, long time. Now, um, learning organizations are very much the vogue, right? Um, when this book was written by Peter Swing in sort of 1980, uh, learning organizations exploded into the business world. Uh, the concepts of system thinking, everybody was a learning organization. Actually, is there anybody here now that thinks they're not part of a learning organization? 
Um, but yet what was happening is everybody was sent to do their MBAs, they were at Stanford, sent to Cambridge, signing up, getting their pieces of paper, being awesome learning organizations. Um, and everybody loved that. But at the same time around uh, when this book came out in, in the 1980s, there was another sort of uh, point that was raised that people sort of grazed over and forgot. Because while continuously learning is important, um, it's also important to recognize, as Bo Hendon called out, that at the same time as we absorb new information, a lot of the data that we hold on actually starts to become outdated and obsolete. And yet if we hold on to this obsolete information and use that to inform our operating principles, we're going to start to struggle. So this was sort of the stage of the world. Most people were still trapped in the world of learning organizations and everybody was doing their MBAs and, and every MBA and executive was talking about a learning organization. But when we start to think about what these companies were, even eight years later, the companies that led the world were still very much based on how big they could grow their market, how great they could be. And even 10 years after that, there was still really no massive disruptions or changes in the way organizations existed, until suddenly everything changed, where people started to recognize that using strategic capability of technology, that they could build platforms to rapidly learn huge amounts of data, synthesize it, recognize what worked and what didn't, learn and unlearn in massive volumes, and optimize the way that they work. Um, and this is a very common pattern, right? For most people, we see progression in a very linear manner. Leaders and managers see the things that made them successful yesterday are going to be the things that make them successful in the future. And they continue to persist with the same behaviors and thinking that made them successful until everything changes, until exponentially new technologies, customer demands, things change and the world changes. And yet you're holding on to the same linear behaviors that made you successful in the past. So really the truth is that it's not um, organizations uh, that get disrupted. Um, the truth is it's actually individuals. The people that lead those organizations. Because they don't cultivate the capability to constantly adapt to new information, new circumstances that presented to them and innovate their own behaviors to match that uncertainty, that change. Actively put themselves in uncomfortable positions. So what I got really curious about was, why aren't people thinking about this more? Um, and what I started to realize is that our learning was a really, really important part. I was working with lots of these executives and leaders in these amazing organizations. And while they were fantastic learners, learning continuously wasn't their limiting factor. It was actually their inability to unlearn their existing behavior and mental models, let go of them, and make space for new information to come in that was holding them back. So this is what led me to think about what unlearning is. And unlearning is not throwing away or getting rid of all, all this knowledge and experience you have. It's actually letting go and reframing it. It's understanding that you need to let go of outdated information to make space for new information to come in. And use that information to inform and adapt your decision making and ultimately your action. And what I found from continuously working with these leaders was that it wasn't just a one and done thing. There's actually a system that you could put into place to constantly recognize when you needed to unlearn. So what I would get you to think about is maybe there's an outcome that you're trying to achieve and you're struggling to achieve it. Or something that used to work for you and then suddenly stopped working for you. You're not living up to the expectations that you set for yourself as you try to solve a challenge. Something that you're avoiding. These are all probably signals to you that you're using behaviors that are not effective to help you achieve the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, and it's time to unlearn. And really what I saw about this is that it's actually a system that you can start to put into place where you can define the outcomes you're trying to achieve, see if you're actually achieving them, see if those signals exist, that's when you need to unlearn and then create a safe space for people to relearn, to experiment with new behaviors, new thinking, to see if they can actually achieve the breakthroughs that they're trying to achieve and the outcomes or aspirations they want to achieve. And the powerful thing about this is it's not just a one and done thing. 
Because as you start to innovate your behaviors, as you start to unlearn existing behaviors and recognize the benefits of adapting your behaviors to new contexts and new opportunities, it becomes a virtuous cycle that you can constantly adapt your thinking and behavior to challenging circumstances and all the uncertainty that we face. So this got me pretty excited. Um, and um, I drew a circle with three boxes. <laughs> right, but often when we're talking about leading these massive uh, change programs, what are, what are the things you always hear the leaders say? What, what's, what's the big speech that they get up and say at the start of the year or whenever we're trying to do something differently? What, what's, the, what's the big mantra? Change is a constant. Good. What else? Change is hard. Good, yeah. What else? Well, what I often hear is, we need to transform, right? And what do we mean by that? Well, normally the person who says, we need to transform, basically means, you need to transform. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing what I always do. Right? And this is a, a classic problem that persists. We, we constantly like, everything would work if that team just changed. If that person just worked differently. Then we'd actually achieve the things that we want. Um, and it was a constant challenge for me. And really, I was working also, and I had to unlearn, from working in a lot of these transformation initiatives, that I was doing these sort of projects and innovation sort of on the sides of these companies, these little sort of nodes on the outer reaches of the organization that, while no matter how successful they were, never really had a systemic impact on the organization. They never really changed the entire system of the organization. So it got me thinking that I was focusing on the wrong node that really what I needed to focus on was who were the people in the systems of these organizations, these complex adaptive systems, that I really need to influence. Because if I could influence them, I could have a systemic effect across the entire organization. And, and that's what got me to uh, this point where I started ExecCamp. Now the idea with ExecCamp is I get executives to leave their business for anywhere between four to eight weeks with the goal of launching new businesses to disrupt their existing organizations. And the idea here is to get people outside their comfort zone and get them to deliberately practice new behaviors for an extended period of time to shift their behavior and ultimately shift their thinking. Now, normally when I tell people I get execs to leave their business for up to eight weeks, they want to know how it works. Or more specifically, specifically what they say is this. Basically, holy poo, how do you do that? And uh, what I normally say is, well, I've got a diagram that wiggles and goes up to the right, so that's pretty much how it works. Um, but what I found from uh, working in, the, in this world, the people, it's a very small majority of people who actually want to work in this way, who want to challenge themselves. Um, and what I've, I've learned from the people who really want to unlearn is that you have to cultivate a series of characteristics about yourself that are really, really important. And the first one is curiosity. And that's really the willingness to, when you hear information counter to your own view, to want to pull that thread and learn more. And this is one of the dangers of expertise. Like how many times have you been on a team where someone comes to you with a new idea or a way to do something that you've done before, and you immediately shut them down and go, no, this is the way you do that. How often have you been curious to ask, why are you thinking like that? bring new information into your perspective. Courage. So what's easy is when things are working. What's really, really difficult is to be accountable to yourself when the behaviors that you are trying are not being effective. It takes courage to recognize that your behavior and your thinking is actually limiting your success, not achieving the outcomes that you want, and stop blaming the other people. It takes courage. And then commitment. You've got to be willing to actually sign up to try and experiment and work and behave in different ways. Because it's easy to go back to your existing behavior and thinking. Which means you've got to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And um, all the best growth I've ever had in my life is when I've got outside my comfort zone. It's where I'm just sort of at, you know, my toes sort of titch, touching the, the bottom of the water as I'm just a little bit out of my depth and actively trying to create scenarios where I am uncomfortable to help me grow and learn and test myself, yeah, you gotta commit to it. And the way you do that is you create safety, is you create safe to fail experiments, 
You think big, you start small, you learn fast about what works and doesn't. And you constantly iterate across a number of different behaviors to find out the ones that are going to make you successful, that are going to work for you as you try to solve these challenging outcomes that you're working for. Okay, so, so this is sort of the context of where I started off. And what I wanted to do tonight is just like share a couple of examples of places where I've been trying to deploy these sort of systems and some of the lessons that we've learned. Does that sound all right? And then at the end, you can all help me for questions, which I'm quite looking forward to. All right, so the first one I think that's most important is uh, mindset. Because what I hear the most when I'm working in these organizations is, we've got a mindset issue here. We just need to change the mindset, and then everything will be great. So how do we tra traditionally change mindsets at the moment? Training, good, yeah, that's right. We sit people in a room, and we talk at them for two days, and then hand them a certificate, and send them out the door with their behavior changed, correct? <laughs> awesome. In fact, we spend $365 billion a year on that exact process, using legacy behaviors to teach people new skills and knowledge, and invest $365 billion a year in it, and less than one in four people says it's actually effective to the business outcomes that they're trying to achieve. Now, this is one of the sort of, again, counterintuitive things. When we talk about when you're trying to shift mindset, everybody thinks that if you want to change your mindset, you just need to start thinking differently, and then you're going to start acting differently. Right? Apple had a great commercial that said, think differently. So now everybody thinks that's the way you innovate. You just have to think differently. Right? No. Okay. The way you actually start to shift your mindset is you have to start by shifting your behavior. Because when you start to act in a different way, you start to get a different perspective of the world. You start to get new information. And that new information runs counter to your existing mental models of the world. You start to experience things in a different way. And that's what makes you shift your mindset. So really, the whole point of this, too, is it's also not a one and done process. The more you change your behavior, the more it gives you different perspectives, the more you start to shift your mindset, the more it encourages you to keep changing your behavior and adapting to these circumstances. So the trick is, if you want to shift your mindset, is not to start thinking differently. You have to start acting differently. And by acting differently, you start to get new perspectives of the world. And that's what helps you start to shift your mindset. So um, I work with the leadership team of International Airlines Group. They're the parent company for British Airways, Iberian and Belling. Uh, they're the sixth air largest airline group in the world. They've got about 63,000 employees. Um, and one of the programs we did with them was to take six of their senior most leaders out of their operating companies for eight weeks with the goal to try and create six new ideas to disrupt not only their organization, but the entire airline industry. And as a result, their own calcified mental models and behaviors of the world. Now, this was quite an uncomfortable and somewhat radical step for a lot of people in these organizations. Would anyone here let their executive team leave their organization for eight weeks? <laughs> Would anyone like their executive team to leave for eight weeks? Right. Yeah, everyone would love it, believe me, right? <laughs> but again, to some of these people, this is actually radical. But what they recognized is they started to unlearn that they couldn't keep doing the same innovation, tried and tactics that they'd applied for a number, number of years and expecting a different result. They needed to try something different. But it was pretty tough, right? Like one of the first weeks, um, we took th these executives out. We brought them, met lots of startups that were trying to kill their company, really shocked their system. Um, and then we started coming up with these ideas that would transform the industry. Now, one of the executives um, was in the industry 20 years, new customers, knew everything they wanted. All we had to do was build this product that they had a great idea to transform the ticketing systems of the world. And they were convinced it was going to work. So um, we got the executive, and we were like, we just need to build this. So I got him to uh, sketch up this idea and then test it with a customer. And he'd not really done stuff like that before, but he was pretty open to it. So how do you think it went when we sat down, they built their beautiful prototype and showed it to a customer? How do you think it went? They didn't like it. They didn't like it. And what do you think the executive's response was?
So the customer was like, this, I don't understand this idea, it sucks. Uh, what do you think the executive's response was? Bring me the right customer, <laughs> correct, okay? So we were like, great, yeah, let's, let's bring you another customer. Okay, so we sat down and we started uh, testing this idea again with uh, the customer. How do you think it went? Right, so we iterated this process for about three or four times and we sat down and, and sort of said to the executive, what, what do you think the problem is? And he was like, the idea sucks, isn't it? It's not the customer. Right, but this was this, their, sort, their sort of unlearning moment. It's where they sort of realized that the behaviors that they were using, pushing their ideas onto their customer, their expertise actually limiting their visibility about what some of the potential issues were, that was actually needed their trigger, their moment to unlearn. You know, and, and this executive actually went on to be probably one of the best experimenters I ever worked with. Because when they had this breakthrough, it reignited their curiosity again. They started to see their implicit assumptions really as hypotheses and things that they should be testing as quickly and cheaply and quick as possible. So it reignited this whole new ideas in them about how rapidly they could experiment and test ideas to see what things worked and what didn't. Because when they saw signals that they didn't expect, they saw those signals as, a, as the system needed to be improved not the individual that was wrong and didn't understand how their system worked. Now, once we came up with these ideas, uh, it was fantastic. We came up with amazing ideas for the airline industry. We created the first ever blockchain identity management for the, uh, product for the airline industry. We used AI and, and um, machine learning to synthesize a lot of their customer data that took six months to do in, in minutes, like literally transformational ideas. Um, but we also had a number of ideas that came out of this eight-week process that we then tried to put into the existing uh, portfolio management process within their organizations. How do you think that went? Yeah, basically, well, it's basically where they go to burn money. You know, because these teams were already fully loaded with their own ideas about things that they were going to work on. And, and you were handing new things over to people with no context, no momentum, no buy-in for these things. And again, this was a real tough on learning moment again for how they would have to do innovation in their products. But it also gave them another breakthrough because they realized that coming up with these ideas and then trying to push them inside their own organization was limiting their success. So as a result, BA opened up all of their assets. They, op they made all their AP uh, assets available through APIs that startups could then start to build on top of those assets and leverage them in ways that they never thought possible before. And they created Hangar 51. It's the first venture capital firm in the, in, in the airline industry where they're actively investing in startups who start to leverage their assets and taking a stake in them uh, and accelerating innovation massively throughout their company by opening up all their systems and letting people build on top of them in ways that they never thought of before. So while all these ideas are fantastic and revolutionary and changed for their business, their, their profitability went through the roof this year. Um, the biggest law, uh, impact has not necessarily been the products that they've built, but it's actually been the shift in mindset. As these leaders have gone back into the organization and then start to coach other people about how to go through their unlearning process and change this. You know, and I love this quote from uh, Stephen Scott, who was the chief innovation officer for IAG. And really what he says is, you know, when, when you're at that point where everybody tells you that you need to stop, that what you're doing is wrong, that's the exact moment that you actually need to double your experiment velocity to really push through and get the breakthroughs that you want. So I want you to think about that as you go along. So while a shifting mindset is really, really important. Um, one of the other big challenges that I come up against is the, gis the gift and also the limitation of expertise. And really what I think about is that we have to unlearn um, from being a know-it-all to a potentially a learn-it-all. Um, and one of the challenges when you're working with these very, very competent people is they're really, really good at what they do. You know, the reason that they are leaders in these organizations is because they're very competent. They have the skills that have risen to the top. All their natural feedback mechanisms in organizations tells them that they're doing the right thing. They're the CEO of these massive organizations. 
they must be doing something right to get these jobs. Um, and it's a challenge. So uh, one of my other customers is um, a really well-known uh, sort of phone manufacturer. And one of the things that they were working on was a business strategy to roll out their new phones uh, throughout the globe. Um, and this team was super experienced. They knew lots about business strategy. They knew lots about their industry. They were domain experts. Um, and they were positive that their strategy was perfect. All it had to do was be executed as they've defined, and then everything would work out, and they'd be delighted. So, so some of my job I describe as actually safely breaking people's mental models of the world. That's, that's literally what I think my job is, is creating uh, opportunities for people to safely learn better information, better information to make better decisions. So if you're trying to help a really experienced leadership team get better information about a business strategy that they've got, what would you do? It's meant to be participation in this talk today. <laughs> How would you do it? Experiment. Experiment. Awesome. What else? Talk to, talk to customers. Perfect. What else? Yep, look at the data, awesome. What else? Look at competition. Look at competition, great, okay, good. All right, so the way I helped them test their business strategy was I gave five of them a $200 prepaid credit card and I told them that they had two hours to go out and sign up to their own services, services that they've designed. So how do you think they got on? How do you think they got on? Badly, maybe, yeah, okay. How, do you, how many do you think people, people were able to sign up for the service? None. None, okay, okay, one was. One was able to, another person nearly did and, th and, and three couldn't get it done in the time zone, right? Um, but again, this was a, a really, really interesting opportunity for them to learn. Initially, they came back again frustrated and angry. The person behind the desk couldn't fill out the forms in time or they had the right data and their address was wrong. And, but when we sat down and helped them reflect a little bit more, they started to realize that these mistakes, these signals from the system, were that it was not operating as they assumed it was, that their assumptions were actually incorrect. And really what they had an opportunity was to learn raw, unsanitized information about how that system was performing. Has anyone ever seen the show Undercover Boss? What do you think happens on that show? Right? These are great learning opportunities where people get to live the life of their customer and understand how their systems are actually working from a customer perspective and learn and unlearn what works and what doesn't to get the breakthroughs that they need. Does anyone know who this is? Yeah, good, right, right, CEO of T-Mobile, awesome. What do you know about the CEO of T-Mobile? Pardon? He, he's quite a character, if any, it, right? <laughs> if anybody has, uh, if he, like, in terms of like Twitter parody accounts, this guy's probably just a, like his own account is a parody of himself. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so this is John McGurge. He's the CEO of T-Mobile, and uh, he took over the organization about sort of six years ago, at the time where AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint were literally like maybe 80 to 85 percent of the U.S. market. And T-Mobile was just, just a tiny little player in that space. Now, uh, John has a, a, a really interesting background of business strategy. He's quite eccentric, and, uh, but a very interesting leader. So when he took over the role as CEO, how do you think he started to understand what the company was doing? So if you were a CEO, what's the first few things you'd do when you joined the company? Very good. Excellent. Right? So, when most people join a company, don't they, they just sit in meetings with everybody in the company telling them what's wrong, what's broken, what they need to fix, what the CEO needs to fix. So John did something very different. John basically installed a phone line in his office, a customer service phone line. And he sat there for four hours a day and just listened to the customer complaints line, a la John Seddon. Right? 
And from that, he started to actually get raw, unsanitized information about how their systems of work were actually performing, what customers understood, what they didn't understand. Now, at the time, most people, when they had a phone, they would travel, they would use their data, they'd have phone calls, they'd have no idea how much their bills were going to cost. There was high variability. People were actually totally opaque about how their billing systems worked. So six years ago, John launched uh, on contract. And what he offered was a $70 flat fee a month. All your data, all your phone, all your texts in one simple flat fee a month. And they obliterated the US market. Because customers didn't understand how these packages worked, and yet they could buy a very simple service, know what they were going to spend, how much they were going to spend, and it would work. The only way you can win in a commoditized industry is you have to take market share back from your competitors. Unlearn contract literally started to obliterate everybody in the US. Then they started to add on packages where you could pay $15, travel internationally, and use your phone as much as you want. And last, in the last six months, they just bought uh, Sprint, the third largest before them, and now they're literally on their way to become the largest in uh, telco in the industry, and everybody loves them. Super cool way to unlearn. So the last thing I wanted us to sort of talk about, though, is this. And it's mistakes and, and unlearning mistakes. Because my belief is mistakes are potentially the single greatest competitive advantage in your organization. If you can harness the power and the information of mistakes, you can create systems to out-innovate and outperform out, uh, out your, your competitors every time. And my favorite example of this is actually uh, NASA. So um, on January uh, 1986, um, Challenger Space Shuttle took off and exploded after 90, uh, or sorry, 76 uh, seconds, uh, with the resulting loss in massive catastrophic failure and the result of uh, lost life. It was uh, up until that point, the space shuttles had been a phenomenal success. They had uh, tens of, uh, of successful launches, no issues. The first person to get it to do a moonwalk in space. They, they just had an amazing run of innovation and breaks. But when the, even when the uh, shuttle exploded, most people within NASA uh, considered it as an act of God. Now, the engineering team had actually told them the mission command not to launch, but they were overruled by the leadership. And what happened, uh, was happening inside NASA is that they had very, very smart people that were building these massive wells of, of, of knowledge. But these towers of knowledge were actually turning into silos of knowledge. They weren't crossing uh, any information across their organization. And the other thing they weren't doing was sharing any mistakes. So uh, one of my mentors is uh, Dr. Ed Hoffman. He was the first chief knowledge officer for NASA, and uh, we worked together on a knowledge management program in Columbia University about helping people uh, learn to unlearn. And, and what Ed uh, discovered at the time is that NASA typically had to fail really, really big in order for them to change the way that they were. People were afraid to uh, share mistakes. Actually, they were shared, afraid to share anything. Because when you have super, super, super smart people who are used to being correct all the time, they don't like being incorrect. And they're also afraid to share when things happen that they didn't expect. Um, so even after uh, the Challenger disaster, very little in, in NASA changed. People still were, were trapped in their own silos. And, and they believed that it was just an act of God until the Columbia disaster a few years later. Now, even the thing about Columbia is they had a technical term for uh, when the tiles would break off the rocket and hit the wings. They called it foam shedding. Uh, they had normalized this deviant behavior. And because the shuttles hadn't exploded, these mishaps were sort of allowed to propagate until the day that the universe hit back and they resulted in catastrophic failure. So one of the things that uh, Ed started to think about is how could he cr start to create a culture where it's safe to share mistakes and use that to innovate the way their organization works. Now, there's two ways that you can get people um, to change their behavior. Uh, when you're trying to change culture. There's two levers. You have a learning anxiety and a survival anxiety. So Edgar Schein talks about these two things. Survival anxiety is this idea that um, 
it's trying to pique your instinct to respond. So often people will say, if you don't do something, your business is gonna be disrupted. They're trying to invoke action in you, right? Now this works for a period of time and then people sort of stop believing it, right? Everyone hears their business is gonna be disrupted, your business still exists, you know? So what, that doesn't really matter. The, the, the unending tap of innovation is actually to reduce learning anxiety in your organization. And learning anxiety is how safe people, people feel to try things and them not work out as they expect. And what's even more powerful is if they can share the information that they've learned from that mistake and use it to infor, or improve the systems of work that they're involved in. So when me and Ed were trying to describe this to people, we talk about this pyramid of advantage and catastrophe. So the idea is mis mistakes are actually signals from your system. They're signals that your assumption is not actually what you expected. So if you can address problems when they're a mistake, you can quickly improve your system and make it better if you can share them. The problem is if you don't share mistakes, they turn into mishaps. And mishaps are when you have a failure but the mission is actually successful. And then if you miss all of these, ultimately it results in catastrophic failures across your organization. So what we started to do, or what Ed started to do, was create a culture where he would bring uh, senior leaders in NASA together just to start sharing stories of mistakes that they had made and how they had used them to start to improve their systems of work. Just very simple, a couple of people sit together over lunch and start sharing different things. Now, um, does anyone know what the number one indicator for high performance teams is? Safety, thank you, all right? So Google did a study to find out what's the leading indicator for high performance teams. The number one indicator, it's not knowing how many Maltesers it takes to fill the um, Empire State Building. That's not what creates a high performance team. It's how safe teams feel to share mistakes or things that they've tried in front of one another. So this started off as teams just simply sharing little stories between one another. Now typically what had been happening in NASA is a lot of their emergent uh, knowledge was being pushed down from Washington uh, by people who were basically theorists, people who were writing one page diagrams and telling you how to create high performance organizations basically. Uh, so what started to happen was as people were sharing this, practitioners were actually sharing information about what really made things work. They started to want to flip the way policies were made. So space junk is a massive problem, right? Does anyone know, is anyone here an expert in space junk? Right, the only people who know anything about space junk are the people who are running the missions and understanding how it's affecting what they start to do. The mistakes that are being made as a result of impacts with space junk. So what started to happen is that the practitioners realized from sharing mistakes with one another that they were creating the emergent knowledge in the space. And what was best was for them to start actually synthesizing that and sharing that back with the bureaucrats. So they totally flipped the entire way the policy was then started to be done around space agencies from just starting to share mistakes internally within NASA, teams then starting to write that up and socializing it so it was the freshest information and then reforming the way that they wrote policy decisions and flipping the whole model. Um, and, that also, and so what this starts to do is then you have better information moving up and down your different systems and then people making better and better decisions because it's real information based on what people are learning and addressing it as they find. Um, so learning anxiety has plummeted um, in NASA and they haven't actually had any catastrophic failures uh, since the Columbia disaster, which is phenomenal in itself. Um, but they don't just stop with reducing learning anxiety. They also just keep tweaking uh, survival anxiety. So every year on the 27th of January, they shut down all of NASA. And um, they invite the families and friends of people who were worked on the space programs at different agencies, people who lost their family, their life um, as a result of some of these catastrophic failures. Because today, less than 40% uh, of NASA's staff were actually didn't even work there when the Columbia disaster happened. So, and the way that they do it is they share stories. They get people to share stories of how much they miss their family, things that didn't work, what mistakes that they've made and how they've tried to improve systems as a result. So they've built in these uh, natural mechanisms to see mistakes as competitive advantages and constantly improve their systems of work, resulting in great innovations and mitigations of catastrophic failures. 
So the one thing uh, I would like you all to think about as you leave here today is how can you actually start to unlearn something? You know, how can you have think big about an aspiration or outcome that you're trying to achieve, but you're not living up to that expectation, you're struggling to achieve it, the things that you're trying aren't actually working, and how you could start really, really small to start to unlearn. So a great method that my coach taught me was, uh, her name's Sabrina, um, the way she thinks about it is this, think about uh, something that you'd really like to try and unlearn, that you're struggling with, and then find somebody you know and trust that you work with or can give you some good feedback. And get them to, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, ask, ask them how well you think you're performing as you're trying to solve a certain thing that you want to unlearn, on a scale of 1 to 10. And then just ask them, what are some of the things you could do to get just like half a point better? Write all those things down. And then pick one of those behaviors that maybe feels a little bit uncomfortable to you, and try and see if that can give you the breakthrough that you're seeking and iterate with them. Go back and check in with them a week later and see if you're performing better. Ask them to scale you again and see how you perform. And very, very quickly, you'll start to be able to adopt this system and start to innovate your behaviors and hopefully get the breakthroughs that you need. So on March uh, 2017, um, IAG, while they had thought big and started small and got eight of their executives, or seven, six of their executives to leave the business for eight weeks, launched the first ever low-cost carrier transatlantic airline group called Level. They do four flights from Barcelona to the US. They sold 52,000 tickets on the first day. They sold 152,000 tickets in the first month of operation. So you can start, think big, and start really, really small, and then ultimately transform to start creating these massive organizations and launch new airlines. So the challenge is, what are you gonna do to start on learning? So the things I want you to think about as you go back is, you know, the way to start doing these things is you've got to think big, but start really, really small. And that allows you to iterate with lots of different behaviors, try different things to see and learn fast what works for you and what doesn't. But the trick is, you've got to choose courage over comfort. You've got to call out and be accountable to yourself that the things that you're doing might not actually be the best way to solve problems and get outside your comfort zone to experiment with them. And the way you do that is you create safety. And you try and scale safety across your entire organization to get everybody to be able to experiment with new behaviors. Um, and if you do that, I guarantee you, you're gonna have exceptional results. Eric Ries said, buy my book. Thanks very much. <laughs>
right? They, were, they, they wanted to use things like maturity models to describe how they were working, which are totally abstract and useless. Um, and wh what tried to happen, and Drew Fairmont, who was the Dean of Cloud Computing at, at Capital One at the time, he built a very simple tool where what they were, the, the goal of going to the cloud was to deliver uh, products faster, uh, improve their customer retention, uh, you know, higher return and revenue. Those are outcomes that the CIO had described. One way they thought they would achieve that is by moving their infrastructure to the cloud so they could deploy faster and cheaper. So he actually built a little tool that would audit how fast and frequent teams were deploying software, uh, look at their audit trails to understand what percentage their of their infrastructure was in the cloud, what their cost ratio was, um, and then he exposed that information. And you know, when they first shared that information, it was horrific to look at because the outcomes that they were aiming for, like you know, 80, 90% of utilization in the cloud, most teams were about five or 4%. Now, if you're in a culture where mistakes are not okay, where you're performance managed on a bell curve, people could use that information in very deviant ways. But the real power, I think, of what they created at Capital One is that sharing, like being transparent about the reality actually allowed them to move, start making better decisions towards the outcomes they needed to achieve. So not tying that to people's performance management, that you're a low number, that's bad. They were like, that's a low number, let's move it to where we want to move it and start taking action, like training people in these certification courses, gamifying it that when the, when they achieved excellence and showed that they're trying to improve their skills, the, like Drew would send emails almost to the CEO going, look at this person, they've just retrained. As soon as you got trained, there was a responsibility on you to be a coach for others. Now the interesting thing about AWS's uh, libraries is that they are innovating so fast that you can't create curriculum to teach the content that AWS are delivering. You know, as soon as AWS release features, um, you know, if you made a course on that, it's obsolete in three months because they've released a whole other. So you actually have to create this community where people who are learning the skills are teaching other people the new skills to onboard them. So this idea, again, this certification is, is just a, a proxy step. The real mastery is, is a continuous learning and teaching culture that they've created and community of teaching and mentoring. Um, again, which is seen as excellence and you're rewarded for coaching other people to help them get better, and, but you're responsible to do it if you've had the opportunity to be trained. So that was a really powerful mechanism that we created there. Um, and, and again, they're, they're like AWS's like star case study that we'll, they'll be at reInvent in next week to probably talk about some more amazing innovations they've created. Um, and so that's probably an example of that. Chapter 10, Incentives, check it out. Barry, what's going on? Hang on, get the microphone, hang on. Uh, this lady up here had a question too as well. Then. On, yeah. on your uh, Uncle Sam slide, um, yeah. you talk about um, trans uh, other people got to transform, but not the managers. Yeah. So how did you get them to unlearn that behavior? Yeah, I think like um, it's, it's sort of this idea like the expertise causes a lot of blind spots, you know? And I think that's again one of the reasons why feedback is so important because it helps you, makes you aware of your blind spots. Um, and then often for uh, these executives and, and really competent leaders is the, the one person that they'll never really argue with is their customer, right? So, so all of these examples that I, was try, I try to create where they can safely sort of break their mental model of the world and recognize that their existing behavior is actually limiting their success. Uh, just like I showed with the, uh, the executive team from the phone company, is by getting them to try and be customers of their own system, they had to experience what they thought was true not actually be true. And that made a blind spot visible for them. And again, these are really humble, great people. Once they see a blind spot, they're like, sweet, uh, I can close that gap now. You know, so I think it's, it's unfair to say that these people are in the majority, you know, arrogant, ignorant, and like, they're really, really smart people. You know, and I think what I find is when you give them a system to get better information, to make better decisions, they're delighted. Because a lot of the information they get is super sanitized, right? Like we all know we've been on projects where you, you mark something as a red, you know, and then you pass it to your manager. And the manager's like, I'm just gonna make that an amber. 
then you know, get to the next manager and they make it like a, well, it's probably sort of light green. You know, and then you've got these leaders in these big organizations with a sea of green in front of them. So they're making a good decision based on bad data and therefore bad results. And really what I'm trying to do is like short circuit that, get great data and then make better decisions and get great results. Cool. All right, Ala. So um, one of the biggest challenges of agile transformation and while moving to new ways of working is capability uplift. Yep. And that in involves a cultural change, a mindset change. So mm -hmm. where do you begin when you have such a, a large group, let's say 20,000 employees, and how do you turn the ship around? Do yep. you, how do you upskill, reskill, bring the new people in? How do you exit people? And where do you start, at the individual level or at the system level? Because yep. Or at the, same, both at the same time? So, you know, like, I, I think what I... What I experienced is when I was working at a, 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 like a, a team level inside a large organization, you would have sort of some effect within that team and the nodes that it might be connected to in a system, right? But that's what made me shift a little bit to say, well, why don't I try and attack the people who have the most influence on the system and go for leaders to change their behavior? And again, one of the stories in the book is uh, the CEO of this very, very well-known card brand. Um, he was trying to, he, his team were doing an agile transformation or business agility transformation. Um, and, but he, he'd never done any agile his entire life. So uh, we, we were coaching them as to how to operate as an agile team. This is the executive team of a $24 billion company. Uh, and, we, you know, and we did a, a retrospective with him after about a month. And he'd never done a retrospective before. Uh, after working in a sort of making them work in an agile way, get them to describe outcomes they were trying to get for the week. They'd never achieved the outcomes because they were just measuring output. So it was very easy for them to tick off their tasks each week and say we were doing great. But when they had to measure outcomes, they realized that the tasks didn't matter. So we did the retrospective after a month and uh, the CEO wrote this card and stuck it up on the wall. And it was uh, agile was hard. Yeah, right, and yeah, literally. And the rest of the team were sort of like gasping as well because they were like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, I thought we were doing Agile, but it's actually, I realized, you know, doing Agile and being Agile are actually different things and it's really, really hard. And all the team were like, wow. And then uh, at the, he was like, yeah, because he'd never done a retrospective before. He's like, yeah, this is great. And then he took the card and he went back to his desk and then he wrote an email and sent it to 50,000 people across the entire organization and he's like, hey, everybody, you know, we're trying to do agile transformation. So the leadership team are trying to work in an agile way. And I just did my first retrospective. I realized it's really hard. Um, so yeah, good luck out there trying to do agile. You know, it's, I recognize it's really hard. <laughs> Amazing, sent it to 50,000 people in his company. Yeah. And um, literally, like, people were stopping me in corridors asking, like, you know, did we give him crack or something like that? Or, <laughs> but, but again, wh what this leader showed was vulnerability. You know, they showed that it was a struggle. They showed that they were striving for excellence. And, you know, what happens in these organizations is everybody role models the leader's behavior. So when you have the senior most person in your company, you know, making themselves vulnerable and saying that they're struggling, and it's tough, that creates a huge space for other people to recognize that it is tough and innovate. And again, they, their company is now growing like 30% year on year, and they're, they're, they're smashing it. You know, and, and again, this, this is the type of leadership they have, so it's pretty cool. All right. Okay, a couple of more, yeah. I'll take maybe two more and then we can go drinking, okay? Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so with the executive teams that you've taken off site and gone through this sort of six to eight sort of program of enforced change, yeah. What were some of the kind of biggest change in perception of what is meant by leadership? Yeah, like, I th you know, I think, um, like, what's really, really hard for these people is, like, all you are leaders, right? How much stuff do you have to go home and fix probably tonight or do tomorrow? Or how long is your backlog of stuff? You know, and people are, they're, they're, they're like, so trapped in, like, the, the tactical of day-to-day -day of just every... Like, executives are just brought from meeting to meeting to meeting to execute, 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 execute. execute. So they never have any time to just stop and reflect. They have no time to actually close any feedback loops. They're just constantly executing, you know? And so 
But what actually was really powerful for them was actually to have a minute to just like step away and just think, right? And I, and I think giving people an opportunity where they had that, giving them a sort of safe period of time and space where they didn't have, the whole company didn't have to watch them learn how to do a prototype, right? Where they could like draw a crappy stick figure and show it to a customer and go, oh, that sucks, okay. You know, they didn't have like 10,000 people of the company going, ah, look, you messed that up. You know, and, and they're people too. So I think giving them like a safe space to experiment, deliberately practicing new routines, right? Giving them space to reflect on what they're learning and adapting. And these are all things that they just, it's very hard for them to get. You know, so again, it's, it's sort of a challenge for us all, right? We're all, we're, as leaders are like super busy. And it's maybe thinking for yourself is, are you over executing? Like, where's the time you're reflecting are you actually achieving the outcomes that you want? Is the things you're doing working? Are you adapting your behavior? If you're in meetings 40 hours a week, where's your time to do that? So I guess that's the sort of thing I'd get you to think about is design that into your working rhythm, just like I'd sit down with them and try and get them to design that into their working rhythm. Okay, yeah, cool question, Alex. Okay, one more, or do we need to go for drinks? Hey, Philippe, cool. So you mentioned that you work with executive, uh, but not all of us here are executive, so how do you create interest for executive, uh, not in the room, to you know be interested in what you say and start applying those things? Yeah, well, this, this is why I have all you here, right? Because you know, I'm not speaking to you know, however many tens or hundreds of people are here tonight. I'm, I'm, what I'm really speaking to is like 10,000 people, right? Because you, you all know people you're all going to go back to your companies and you can share these stories and you can, you know, and, and letting them know that people are doing this type of stuff, right? When I, when I go out, um, I, you know, that we had another event on Tuesday night and uh, the CIO of one of these companies literally got up there and was sharing this story back with a, another of people who were like directors, VPs and, and chief product officers. And again, half the room gasped. But then again, he said, "Is look, well, what are you doing to innovate? Are you doing your one-day innovation offsites, your one-week quarterly offsite, your, you know, retreat for a weekend? Like, how's that working for you? You know, so it's this idea that if people keep repeating the same behaviors and expecting a different result is what our friend Einstein might say is insanity. And um, so the courage is to recognize it's not working, and like try something different. And you know what?" They said they were going to do it for eight weeks, but they could have cancelled it after two weeks. If it really wasn't going so bad, they can just kill it and move on to another idea. And I think that was a real powerful learning for um, yeah, Willie Walsh, the CEO of uh, International Airlines Group. Right? He, he recognised he would have to change his behaviour about leading this type of initiative, um, which is, again, a really powerful thing when he kicks off an initiative and, and says, go experiment, go try things, because... The organization will stop us. We don't have to worry. If we're doing such and radical, the, organize, the system will stop us. So let's not, not start because worrying about being stopped. Why don't we just move and see where we get to? I think that's a really powerful shift in behavior. So yeah, go back and tell your, your, your CEOs and directors they should do an exec camp, and then we'll all go, go have some fun together. <laughs> all right. Uh, listen, uh, honestly, this is, uh, for me, this has been a really, really special night. So many of my great friends and people I've got to work with in the audience here, uh, I feel like I'm here because I've just sucked all your brains and tried to like, synthesize it in the world. So thank you very much for sharing this moment with me. It's a real pleasure. And uh, see you out there for another beer soon, OK? Thanks very much. Thank